Aloha, welcome to Global Connections on the ThinkTech live streaming network. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here today with John Gotanda, president of Hawaii Pacific University, to talk about resolving international investment disputes. Hi, John, welcome to the program. Aloha, thank you for inviting me. Great to have you here and talk about this topic, which you've had so much experience in and written so much about. Um, uh, first, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about your background because you are back in Hawaii since, since July to take over the helm at Hawaii Pacific University after uh, about 30 years on the mainland practicing law, but you're, you're originally from here, right? I'm originally from here. I was born and raised in Manoa Valley, grew up in Manoa, uh, attended Roosevelt High School, uh, then the University of Hawaii. Uh, actually, while I was also uh, attending high school and then going on to uh, to college, I was involved in the music industry while I was here. I, I used to play music and then I started producing uh, records while I was here. And then I gave that all up actually once I started college and, mm. and I ran of all things uh, while I was doing my undergraduate uh, studies at the University of Hawaii, Lynn's Deli in, in Ala Moana Center. Mm. Uh, and then after that, I decided to go to law school. and. Uh, at the third year of law school, I, I've always thought that I would practice law in, in, in Hawaii and was very much looking forward to that. And I had the opportunity to go work at the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down. It was a two-year appointment at, at the D.C. Circuit. And I thought I would go for two years and come right back. Well, I, I went for, yeah, I, I moved to Washington, D.C., started working at, at the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, and then, you know, two years at that point turned in into 30. And, and along the way, uh, I, after working at the court, I joined the law firm of Covington and Burling. And that's where I was actually introduced to, to international investment arbitrations. I practiced international law uh, at Covington and Burling for a number of years. Uh, spent a year in, in Boston as an attorney and then joined Villanova University as, as an assistant professor. And, and then uh, became full professor, I was associate dean, and then dean of, of the law school for a number of years uh, before coming home to, to join uh, HBU. And it's exciting to be back. That's so great, yes. And I've gotten to know you at HPU, uh, but I've seen so many of the interesting writings you've, that you've done. Um, so I'm really excited to hear more about that directly from you for the first time. And um, I think it's really important because, you know, I think by now we're all very aware how, how connected our economy is to the global one. And um, I think, you know, it's interesting to, to know more about, like, how this global economy, it is sustained by this, this system of, of different kinds of, of uh, things like the legal framework that, that give for example, investors' confidence that their contracts would be upheld or that there's some recourse in, in when there is some breach of contract or, or issues with their investment. And this is kind of the area that you've been specializing in. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've been a, a professor uh, teaching international courses, contracts, uh, and other, other classes. I've um, been an expert in, uh, in international matters uh, for uh, for both the uh, U.S. government as well as private parties. And I have been a frequent speaker uh, on, on the subject of international dispute resolution, on resolving international contract disputes, and international investment law. Uh, and I've also been an, an arbitrator in resolving um, large international disputes, investment, mm -hmm. particularly investment disputes. Mm -hmm. Is it quite frequent that, that there are disputes in, in international investments? Well, the studies indicate that, that there are more sort of claims uh, being filed uh, in recent years. That, that number has gone up. I think it goes up and down depending on, on the situation in the world and, and with the economy. There's never a, a, a large, a particularly large group of, of these cases, but there are some uh, that, that are particularly newsworthy. And these are, these basically, if I could back up for a second, mm -hmm. these disputes that we're talking about are basically between investors and a government. Mm -hmm. And they're usually foreign investors uh, and, and a particular government. And the reason why this mechanism was created is because we needed a neutral form to resolve these disputes when they arise. And international arbitration provides sort of that neutral form and importantly an enforceable award. Uh, because if 
there is no treaty, network of treaties, that provides for the enforcement of a court judgment. So if you were to obtain a court judgment in the United States and try to take it to another country to enforce, there is no net global network of treaties that provide for the foreign enforcement at the moment of, of court judgments that's mm -hmm. been widely adopted. By contrast, there is a network of treaties out there uh, for the enforcement of arbitral awards. And so you can take an arbitral award, for example, that's issued in one of the countries to what is called the New York Convention, one of these big treaties that has over, you know, well over 100, I think that they're up to 156 or so, uh, or more uh, countries. And you can enforce it in any one of those other countries. So it creates mm -hmm. a mechanism where one can resolve a dispute mm -hmm. and can have an enforceable decision. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, um, having this mechanism to resolve then disputes is, is very important and is vital to, I think, the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that this provides a recognized form for enforcing and, and for the judgments to be accepted by the, the parties that are, are in dispute? Right. All right. And what are some of the cases where you might have a, a dispute arise? Uh, you were mentioning this is typically between private investors and governments. Right. What typically happens? Or and typically scenarios? there would be an investor, a company would go in, or it could be an individual, would go in and invest in, make an investment in a... A, let's say a foreign country because it would be foreign to that, that investor. So what are some of the most typical types of claims that we see? Uh, oil exploration, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of infrastructure development, water bottling plant. Um, it might be some kind of mining activity, be it gold, silver, copper. Uh, it, it might be the construction of an electrical plant. So there are many different types of investments that can happen in, in countries. There might be big infrastructure projects too. Uh, but these are typically, uh, and they can be small. They don't have to be, be large uh, types of investments. But typically I'm involved in, in the relatively large investments, the, the investments where a company goes in to extract minerals or, or oil. Uh, or, or, or to build a, a power plant or that, those types of cases. Those are the cases perhaps you see more often um, because they're, they're big and they get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but they really involve uh, a dispute between an investor and, and a, a foreign government. Mm -hmm. And typically they're resolving the dispute pursuant to two vehicles. One would be a contract. So typically when the investor goes into a foreign country, they would have an agreement with, with that country on, on what exactly are the responsibilities of each party uh, pursuant to, to this transaction uh, and, and how to resolve also the dispute. But in many cases also there's a treaty on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's an agreement, government to government agreement. Mm -hmm. And the government to government agreement will all often provide in a number of these uh, ways for investors to resolve disputes pursuant to typically arbitration. So you can have mm -hmm. breach of contract cases mm -hmm. founded on the contract, or you can have a breach of treaty type oh, of claim. Uh -huh. Uh, which is much different from the breach of contract case mm -hmm. or could be similar to, to a simple sort of breach of contract. Uh, sometimes you need different forms to bring them in. Sometimes you can bring them in the same form. It, it just depends. But the, uh, the typical treaty case usually involves claims of expropriation. Mm -hmm. So the government comes in and decides to nationalize the industry and, and therefore takes the property and, and then the question is was this a, a lawful activity on the part of the government? Did they even do so? Uh, and, and then what would be the, um, the remedy mm -hmm. in the end? Uh, it could also involve a claim of breach of treaty. And typically the treaty would not only contain an a, uh, expropriation type of, of clause and you know, saying that the government will not expropriate property without paying just compensation, which is also a, a concept that's enshrined in, in the American Constitution. Uh, but there would also be a breach of treaty claim, perhaps, for fair and equitable treatment. Mm -hmm. That 
uh, foreign investors will be treated on the same terms as, as, as domestic parties should be. Uh, and, and it's a bit more complicated than that, but essentially it's that, that the parties will be treated in similar fashion. You won't discriminate against, against the party mm -hmm. because they, they are not from that, that particular country. There are other claims uh, that are also there that you have afford uh, the foreign investor with, with certain protection, security and protection. So there, the treaty oftentimes outlines the obligation of a government to provide investors, uh, foreign investors in that mm -hmm. government. And if those obligations aren't met, then the investor can often bring a claim mm -hmm. under the treaty for breach, breach of that treaty. I see. Okay. So is equitable treatment that's only um, if the, there is a bilateral treaty that, that stipulates that? So it's not necessarily a universal practice that, that right. foreign firms and domestic firms are treated equally. Right. There, there, are, there is a growing body of international jurisprudence on what constitutes a fair and equitable treatment. In, in terms of what, what a discrimination claim would be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that there could be a violation, perhaps, of, of customary international law. Uh, on the other hand, though, in order to bring such a claim, you would need to bring it typically pursuant to a treaty or pursuant to some agreement to resolve disputes. Uh, without that, uh, it, it would be it would be difficult to bring the claim in and of itself without some kind of mechanism to do so. Mm -hmm. Did you did you focus on international law while you were in law school, or is this something that you kind of developed expertise in? Yeah, I did not <laughs> in, in law school. It's amazing. <laughs> it sounds very complex. Because I, I thought in the end I, I would practice uh, corporate law, uh -huh. uh, and when I wound up at the U.S. Court of Appeals did a lot of, of litigation in the mm -hmm. end, appellate type of work. And then when I wound up uh, at the law firm in, in Washington, D.C., they had a wide variety of practice areas. I mean, they represented everyone from the NFL to, to governments and to, they did very fascinating type, type of work. And so uh, I chose, I asked if I could do international uh, law as a practice here, and they gave it to me, so I, I, I really lucked out in the end. Oh yeah, it sounds really fascinating, but very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting. Um, well, we got to take a break for a minute, so uh, we'll come back in one minute to talk more with John Gotanda about resolving international investment disputes in Global Connections here. I'm your host, Grace Chang. See you in a minute. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii over the coming weeks and the alternative fuel supply chains necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. We are going to invite in and we will have significant interviews with various stakeholders, including our producers, which are our farmers, and our scientists, our conversion technologies, including Terviva, who we'll see in two weeks, as well as our consumers. Uh, in, within there, we're also going to have the investor groups necessary to make sure that this uh, can advance. So I do hope you join us as we explore our deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii. Hi, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang, here with John Katanda, president of Hawaii Pacific University, and we're talking about resolving international investment disputes. Wow, that was really interesting. I had no idea that there were so many layers to uh, international investments, and it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how, how, did this, how did international law in this field unfold? Like, did it, did it uh, take a while to develop so that you know we we could support all of these international economic activities around the world. Well, these disputes have been going on for a long time because as, as there has been for forever in you know, global commerce, mm. uh, and and so you do see some very early decisions, and, and sometimes their their governments bring the decisions on behalf of of parties, uh, but there is unfolding more and more recently a lot of jurisprudence in this area. 
One of the fascinating things, though, about these types of disputes is that it is a mix of public and private international law. Mm. Public international law, meaning it involves treaties and, and sort of government and policy. Mm. Uh, private international law uh, is often involved, too, because it involves a contract or an agreement between uh, the government and a private party. So it brings together two different types of, of legal um, systems. And and it and the intersection of that is is very fascinating. It's it's new. It's it's very much on the cutting edge of of the development of law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I recall that. I don't know if you remember uh, a few months ago. I believe uh, the Republican candidate Donald Trump had had claimed that he would build a wall in Mexico and charge it to Mexico. And when he visited Mexico, I think there was some controversy in the, the Mexican government. And one of the officials uh, asserted, if he does that, if he charges the wall to us, we'll, we'll seize all the American investments in the country. So is this with this? I mean, and this then is they not would happening. file a, a NAFTA claim <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because the North American Free Trade Agreement provides for a dispute mechanism for uh, investors in any one of those three countries mm -hmm. to file claims. And I was actually involved in, at one point, one of the largest uh, NAFTA cases filed against the United States government. Mm -hmm. So so it doesn't just work with, with uh, you know, Mexico, it can be Canada, it can be the United States. A and so an investor filed a claim uh, against the U.S. government under NAFTA claiming uh, various sort of breaches of, of the treaty. Uh, and, and I was brought in actually by the U.S. government as one of their experts on damages because one of my areas of expertise is damages in international law. Mm -hmm. And as far as damages and, how, uh, damages and how to assess that, is there a universal calculus for determining damages? Has that been controversial at all? It's been incredibly controversial because there are no one, or is no one uh, universal standard. And assessing damages and calculating damages is has oftentimes been viewed as more of an art form rather than a science. Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's true. I think there is a lot of science actually involved. And I think today we are recognizing that the use of finance and economics can have a real impact on, on the law. And damages is one particular area. So to give you an example, in the area of assessing damages, there are various ways that one can look at this and figure out what is uh, the, in, in these particular cases, you're often looking at trying to make the investor whole for the loss. And so what did they, they lose? These are big types mm -hmm. of projects that often are investments that go on for many years that are now cut short. So how does one make that, that investor whole if and assuming there is is a breach, because there may not be. In many of this case, in many of these cases, there there are no breaches of treaties, or or there, uh, or the government uh, has found to have acted appropriately. But in those cases where uh, there is damage, uh, mm -hmm. then the question, or there may be a lawful taking in the end. It could be that the government says, look, we do want to nationalize this, but we're doing mm -hmm. it in a particular manner. And, in a lawful manner, and therefore compensation is due, and the question is over how much. Mm -hmm. So figuring that out is particularly complicated, and there are various methods. One is to look at comparable sales. What are the comparable transactions? Well, typically there are not a whole lot of comparable transactions in the hundreds of millions or billions dollar type mm -hmm. range in these type of cases. Uh, so then another way that one might look at this is through using sort of the book value. Uh, what is the, the investment and then bringing that up to date. Another method would be to take the cash flow and it's called the discounted cash flow method. And up until recently, the discounted cash flow method was relatively discredited in, in many arbitrations. And recently, I mean 20 or so years. Mm -hmm. But in the not too distant past, uh, many tribunals would say that, that they would not look at this. Yet this is the typical vehicle that investors, the mm -hmm. markets, mm -hmm. and, and others would often value a company. So increasingly what we've seen is people are becoming much more sophisticated and they are looking to things like the DCF method uh, to form and inform sort of the valuation of a company. So we've seen the law, I think, evolve in that manner to where it is 
today a, a well-recognized tool. It's not the only tool mm -hmm. that can be used, but it is one of the, the tools that can be used. Mm -hmm. Another area that we've seen, I think, particularly developments in the law is uh, at the intersection of law and, and business in particular is in the area of interest and the awarding of interest. These cases tend to go on for many years mm. and uh, because of, and they involve large amounts, interest tends to be an important part of, of the claim. And so the question would often arise, well, what, how do you determine the interest rate? Is it a market rate or is it a fixed rate that's set mm. by statute? And whether it's simple or compound, you know, if, if we invest in, in our savings account, we put money in a savings account, we are earning compound interest there. Mm -hmm, okay. Yet until, I would say, 20 years or so ago, uh, compound interest is not the norm, even though in, in international disputes, although today it has become the norm. Uh, because it recognizes, tribunals have been recognizing the, the reality, the financial reality that, that uh, compound interest is a regular vehicle that, that is paid today. In, in, and so that if a party loses the use of money, mm -hmm. uh, they typically will lose the use of money in, in terms of compound interest, not simple interest. And, and so that it's not always the case, but, but there has been a growing acceptance of, of that. And I think it's because of the acceptance of, or the growing recognition of financial principles coming to bear and economics coming to bear in, in the law. So I think it's a particularly exciting time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you have a background in business administration as That's well, right. correct? And so this must be very helpful, but especially as this field is is getting more, uh, there's more intersection between the two, business and, and law itself. Um, what have been some of the most interesting cases or situations you've been involved in? Can you talk about Oh, there are, there are a lot <laughs> of sort of interesting cases uh, that, that I've been involved in over, over the many uh, years practicing in the international area. Um, the fall of the government of Iran and uh, at back in the 70s uh, created a host of claims. Uh, and one of my first experiences and exposures to international arbitration uh, was to uh, work with a private party in, in resolving a dispute with, with the government of Iran. And that, that was a fascinating uh, case, mm -hmm. case to work on in the end. And so there are many types of cases uh, out there that are just, um, I think, very interesting because they arise from, as I said, large types of, of interesting infrastructure type projects. Uh, and, and that, um, and, and interesting situations that, that governments are faced with. And, and so I think that, that seeing this unfold and then being a part of it is actually quite, quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about interest, and, and then you bring up the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and, you know, the Is in Islamic legal principles, there is no concept of interest. Mm -hmm. um, so does, is there this kind of a consideration in, in the assessment of, of damages and, and what the interest rates are? Sure, absolutely. And in fact, if the agreement um, or the choice of law would be the law of the Islamic Republic of Iran or, or other countries where under Sharia law they would not allow for the payment of riba or interest, uh, then, then interest would not be awarded in, in some of these cases. On the other hand, uh, you know, it, depending on the forum and the venue and the choice of the particular law, uh, there may be a provision, you know, a, a way for a procedure or a legal principle uh, that would allow for interest to be awarded in that circumstance. And even in countries like Iran, there are exceptions to the awarding of interest where the government um, and, and uh, scholars have recognized that it may be appropriate under Islamic law in certain situations for interest to be, to be paid. Now again, I'm not a, a real expert on Islamic law, but mm -hmm. I have seen decisions uh, that speak to, to the awarding of interest and legal opinions on uh, speaking to the awarding of interest under, uh, under Islamic law in, in certain situations. Mm -hmm. So it is fascinating that you see from a public policy standpoint 
that there are situations where there are principles and basic important principles uh, that come to bear um, public policy principles like the prohibition on the awarding uh, of interest in the international legal arena. And how does that work? How does that interplay when other countries and other practices like in the United States or in many parts of the world, interest is a well-recognized and accepted principle. So what happens? How do you resolve the, the tension? And, and that's mm -hmm. what happens in these international disputes. Oh wow, that's really fascinating. So we have we have not just law, but we're talking about business, finance, as well as looking at different cultural systems as well. Mm -hmm. Really fascinating, and and that's great to, that you are back here in Hawaii, bringing all of this experience that you've garnered over the past what is it, thirty years? Thirty years. Is now. that right? Yeah. Wow, real wealth of of uh, experience to bring back here and. Um, as for your music, though, that's you, you're a really well-rounded individual. Are you still playing music, writing music? I haven't done that for a while, but I would love love someday to get back into it. Oh yeah, yeah. and and yeah. what about making donuts? Yeah. Oh, that's right. so for a short time I was a baker too at at Dunkin' Donuts and. Uh, but I think I've given that up. For oh, a while. really? Yeah. Okay. Well, you have such a fascinating and inspiring story um, coming through so many different, you know, paths in life, and and really, really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you, John. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. It was very educational. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for thank you for joining us on Global Connections. I'm your host, Grace Chang. You can find me here every Thursday at 1 p.m. See you next time. Aloha.